Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hagley Museum and Library. I am Lucas Clausen, historian here at Hagley, and today we're going to tell you a little bit about Hagley, about the library, about the building that we're in, about some of the stuff that's on the tables, which are treasures from our collections, and whatever you want to know. So feel free to type in a question at home. We're going to see it pop up here. We've got a couple of other people here with me in the reading room that's going to help make sure that we can respond to your questions and have a discussion as we go about some of the things that are here. So let's start at the very beginning. Who are we and what do we do? We are Hagley Museum and Library. We are where the DuPont Company started in 1802. It is a museum that covers American business, enterprise, innovation in a big way, and so the library does as well. When you come here to the site, it's a 235 acre property where you see the ruins of the powder yards, you see examples of worker housing, you get to see a school where some of the workers, children went to school and some of the workers themselves. And then also the DuPont family home built in 1802, as well as the gardens that go with the home. We are very lucky here at Hagley in that we have such wonderful documentation on ourselves. One of the assets we have here in our library is all of the company's records from the time this site operated, which was from 1802 to 1921. There's not much about the site that we don't know. There's not many questions we can't answer. So when doing our interpretive work and doing restoration work on the property, it's fantastic because the documentation is so good. And I'll be showing you some of that as we take a tour of the stuff. So the library itself, what is the library all about, which is part of the reason why we're here? The library got started in 1961 as part of the larger effort to document the DuPont family, DuPont company, and American business. So it started actually in the mid-1950s as an effort between the DuPont family, the DuPont company, coming up on the uh, company's 150th anniversary in 1952 of how do we document a company like this, something that's so big for Delaware, for the nation. So the family got together, the company got together, pulled together a few pieces of property, and started the Hagley Museum in 1958. During this time, you also had a library which was going at Winterthur, just up the road, one of our, our fellow institutions, and also Longwood Gardens. So Pierre DuPont at Longwood had a tremendous collection of DuPont family materials, company materials, business materials, and so you're going to see some of that today too. The folks who were involved with this, so again, DuPont family, DuPont company, boards of both entities decided they wanted to try to pull resources together for a library, and out of that comes our library. So in 1961, we built one of the buildings, not the one that we're in today, but built that to house our library, and it has expanded tremendously over time. The initial collecting focus was DuPont family, DuPont company, then to business in Wilmington and the Brandywine Valley, over time, that expanded to business in the Delaware Valley, to business in the Mid-Atlantic region, to business in the U.S., to business around the world. So when you come and research in our library, you're going to see a whole variety of things. We're now one of the largest business history libraries in the United States. We have the collections of over 1,000 U.S. businesses and trade associations. Many companies you've heard of, many that you haven't. So we have a large portion of the Pennsylvania Railroad records. Avon Products Incorporated, their records are right here with Hagley. The only complete set of Enron board minutes left in existence are with us right here at Hagley Museum and Library. So it's a lot of stuff. We cover a lot of ground. The collections start in the year 1450 and go to the present. And it covers all sorts of things from the French Enlightenment through the DuPont family collections, the French Revolution, to business in America, to packaging, processing, design in the United States, all sorts of things. We cover a lot of ground with, with the collections that are here. And so we see researchers from around the world who come and use our collections. There's not a week that goes by that I don't talk to somebody on the other end of the earth who is interested in the collections here at Hagley, which is pretty exciting for me. So my role here at Hagley, I am the Hagley historian. I started off here in 2007 as an intern. So working with collections processing. So what that means is when we get a new collection in, what do you do with it? So we have to kind of take it apart and put it back together again, make an inventory, see if anything needs to be fixed, see if there's any problems, put it in proper boxes, write up that inventory, get what's called intellectual control. That way we know what's there, how to describe it, how to make the sell to researchers to come in. And then we put it in our archives. So that's whenever it ends up here. 
So when you come here, what you're gonna see is what's called a primary source material. For all you kids at home, primary source materials are the things that we use to do history. It's, it's the stuff we make history from. Secondary source materials are things that people write about history. So you use a primary source to make a secondary source. So a primary source includes things like letters, record books, drawings, all sorts of things that people create to document what they do at the time, want to try to document things for later to communicate with each other. So in a way, even the text messages that you send back and forth, things that you put up on social media are considered a primary source. So if I look into this primary source and write a book out of it, that means I'm creating a secondary source. So what you're going to see today is many of our primary source materials that are here at Hagley. Just in this department, we have over 48,000 linear feet of stuff. That means if you take boxes and line them all up, they would go nearly eight miles. So that's a lot of stuff that's here in our library. So in, in going through to pull out some of the things that are here, it, it's kind of a difficult job for me because it's like asking me which of my cats is my favorite. How do I pick my favorite cat? So it's like, how do I pick my favorite thing from the library? Especially because part of what I do as Hagley's historian is outreach work. I talk to people about what's here. I do research in the collections and go out in Delaware, go out regionally and talk about DuPont company history, history in Delaware, those sorts of things. So a lot of what you're going to see today are things that are, are near and dear my heart, really near things that are for us here in the library and me here personally. So without further ado, let's dig into some of the things that we have here at Hagley. And we'll start with this. I'm always asked, what is the oldest thing in the library? And that is this unassuming book. And let me open it up for you. So those of you at home who are excellent at medieval German, perhaps you'll know what this is. This is called a Feuerwerkbuch, roughly translated as a firework book. This came out of Germany in the year 1450. And the idea is it's a manual to tell you how to make black powder. There were several of these that were made throughout Europe. The idea being that you have a basic formula. Here's how you make black powder. And then from there, you add in specific regional knowledge. So everything that you see in this book is all specific to a place. All of the writing here tells you about how, where this was written, that you can make black powder, how to source raw materials, how to deal with making something like black powder. And so one of the really neat things about this, how we know that it's from 1450, we know specifically it's from December 27th, 1450, because the person who copied this book, again, those of you who are expert in your medieval German, that's the inscription. It says that it was written in this year of our Lord, 27th of December, the year of our Lord, 50th year of 1400. So 1450, December 27th, 1450. So some of you no doubt at home have noticed that I'm handling this book, a medieval document, barehanded. And so the reason for that is that it's actually safer than wearing gloves to handle these documents. The best thing in the world that you can do is wash your hands, which is good advice, especially for all you kids at home. Wash your hands all the time, and especially whenever you're handling documents. So as we're taking the walk about today, you'll notice that, again, I'm using my bare hands to touch these. I've washed my hands thoroughly before getting into anything that's here. But using my bare hands, I can feel what I'm doing. I'm able to touch this. I'm not going to drop anything. Also, like with cotton gloves, you could catch the edges of this paper and inadvertently tear it because a lot of these documents are fragile. So keep that in mind as we're walking about seeing things today. The next thing I'll show you, in addition to being asked what is the oldest thing at the library, I'm frequently asked what is my favorite thing at the library. And so again, that's like asking me to pick which is my favorite of my three cats, but it changes all the time. And today, this is my favorite document, another unassuming thing. And I know you at home won't be able to read it, so let me explain to you a little bit about what it is, and I'll read it for you. This is a letter from John Philip Sousa to Pierre S. DuPont, the Pierre DuPont who started Longwood Gardens. So during the teens, 20s, he had all sorts of people come to Longwood to give concerts, not the least of which was John Philip Sousa and the Sousa Band. So those of you that have known me for a long time know that I started off life before becoming an historian as a trumpet performance major in college. 
So I uh, spent a little bit of time out and about playing and I especially love John Philip Sousa. So stuff like this really makes me happy. So let me read the letter to you and uh, perhaps you'll understand why I get such a kick out of it. It's dated July 17th, 1924. And this is in, a res in response to a letter that Pierre DuPont wrote to John Philip Sousa asking for a list of all of his marches. He says, my dear Mr. DuPont, I am sending you a list of marches composed by me. There are possibly a few more that have escaped my memory and even some that are on this list out of print. I have been writing marches a long while for some of them that are played today dated back 50 years and you see I started rather early. The review, which was the first march published, dates back somewhere around the Stone Age. It was probably one that Noah marched out of the ark with. Believe me, very sincerely, John Philip Sousa. So this makes me laugh that he says that he was composing songs since Noah came off the ark. So a shout out to some of my friends out there who knew me back in the day who were music majors. There you are. Now we'll get into some of the, the heart of our collection, some of the fun things that are here that deal with the DuPont family, DuPont company, and then spread out from there. So the DuPont family's collections are where this all starts. And the head of the family when the DuPont came to the United States in 1800 was Pierre Samuel DuPont de Moore. So he was part of what's called the physiocratic group in Europe. So he lived in France and Paris in the 1760s, 70s, 80s. And so he was part of this physiocratic movement. They were political, economic, educational thinkers who traveled in all sorts of circles, knew a lot of people, not the least of which was King Louis XVI of France. So Pierre Samuel de Pont Denemore's educational economic philosophies got him on the attention, on the radar, so to speak, of Pierre Samuel de Pont, or on the, of Louis the Sixteenth of France. So if you look right here, that is the signature of Louis the Sixteenth. This is a passport which allowed P.S. de Pont Denemore to travel around Europe to be an economic and educational advisor. Louis the Sixteenth let him go around to places like the court of Baden in Germany and also Sweden to be an educational economic advisor. DuPont de Nemours wrote a lot of books. One that he wrote, and this is an example of one here on the table, which also has a photograph of him. And this is a pretty fragile book, so we're not gonna handle it any more than we need to. Here's a photograph of, or an engraving rather, of DuPont de Nemours. And this is called his universal philosophy. This is the big picture of what his physiocratic ideals are all about. This is it all codified into one thing. And one of the neat things about this book is that if you flip through it, you can see his own notes, which are in it. And I know this is a little, probably gonna be a little bit hard to see for you all at home, but there's little pieces of paper that he glued into the book. And then also you can see his notes scribbled throughout where he did several editions of this book, adding to it, writing other things about it. So my second favorite item in the collections is another kind of unassuming document. And the thing to pay attention to is the signature, Bonaparte. So this is a letter from Napoleon Bonaparte thanking DuPont de Nemours for a copy of the book I just showed you, The Universal Philosophy. So to the point of DuPont de Nemours and the DuPont family knew practically everybody. Their correspondence list reads like a who's who of anybody who was anybody in the United States and Europe from the 1770s up until E.I. DuPont's death in the 1830s. It's pretty incredible some of the documentation that's here. One of the other people who loom large in our collections is letters from this guy, Thomas Jefferson. So P.S. DuPont de Nemours and Jefferson became good friends when Jefferson was consul of France in the 1770s. They found that their educational, philosophical, economic ideas lined up pretty well, particularly in thinking about a country having an export rather than an import economy. They became fast friends and wrote about anything and everything. It's incredible. So they wrote about sheep, geopolitical happenings during the War of 1812, they even wrote about things like the Louisiana Purchase. So how many of you people at home knew that the DuPont family or Delaware had anything to do with the Louisiana Purchase? I can't see your hands raised, but I'm sure that a few of you do, that you didn't know anything about it. So part of why this letter I'm holding is important 
is it's part of the discussions for the Louisiana Purchase. So in 1802, the Louisiana Territory changed hands from Spain to France, and President Thomas Jefferson was worried that the United States would lose access to the Mississippi River and the port of New Orleans. So he briefly thought about going to war with Napoleon to get access to the territory. But he had at least the forethought to write to people and ask their opinion. And one of the people to whom he wrote was Pierre Samuel de Pont de Nemour. So de Pont de Nemour was in France at that point as a minor official in the French government. His advice back to Jefferson, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, was that Napoleon has bigger fish to fry on the continent of Europe, keeping in mind this is 1802. Make him an offer he can't refuse, we'll help you with the financing, which is essentially how this played out. So de Pont de Nemour... This is a letter from DuPont de Nemours to Thomas Jefferson. Advised Jefferson on this and also helped arrange financing for the Louisiana Purchase. So there's a lot of national history embedded here in what we do at Hagley. Pretty neat stuff. So back to the idea of our site being well documented, one of my other favorite items in our collection and also to get you into some of the artwork that's here is this watercolor. This is done by a fellow named Charles Dalmas who was a, uh, related to the DuPont family by marriage. This was done sometime around 1806-1807. And what it's depicting is this guy with the great hairdo, which is E.I. DuPont, supposedly confronting powder yard workers who, if you look closely, are passing a bottle. One of the rules for the DuPont Company was that you should not be drunk or drinking while you're working at the DuPont Black Powder Factory because, of course, you're making explosives. That could be really dangerous. So drinking and, as another rule went, uh, play and disorderly fun were prohibited, so you shouldn't be horsing around doing anything. The caption at the bottom, which I know you're not going to be able to read at home, roughly translates to E.I. DuPont asking, what are you doing? And the reply is, we have fun. So this is one of the neat things in our collection that depicts some of the powder yard workers and some of the problems of running a business like a black powder factory in the early 19th century. Any of you that come to Hagley and take a tour, you'll notice that we have a lovely set of gardens which are behind our main house. E.I. DuPont, Eliotaire Irene DuPont, who started the black powder factory, loved botany. In fact, he didn't want to go into black powder manufacturing when they came to the U.S. He initially wanted to be a botanist. But black powder manufacturing was something that he could do, make money at, something that could stick. So that's what he got into. But he did not relinquish his love of gardens. What I'm holding up for you is a plan of the garden that he put together behind his house. So if you come here and take a tour, the garden is restored close to how it would have looked whenever E.I. DuPont put it together around 1806. This is the main part of the garden close to the house, and then his orchard. So back to the idea of are the documentation here being so good, we are absolutely positively happy that we can do things such as put trees back almost to the place where they exactly were whenever E.I. DuPont put them in. We are so fortunate to be able to have items like this in our collection and documentation on ourselves that are so good that we can do that. So some of the treasures here at Hagrid. Sarah says, oh my gosh, the garden plan, that's incredible. Good, glad that you're getting into the garden plan. We are pretty happy about that too. So in throwing this up, I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Pete Tottle who asked me uh, not to put up dirty old ledger books, but I'm throwing this up here for a reason, that this is uh, one of the more fun things here, and it's one of the more heavily used parts of our collection. But this book, in particular, is one of a series called Pettit Ledgers. So these are the DuPont Company pay books from the 19th century. Genealogists come and use these records pretty frequently because it gives you a record of pay for everybody who worked for the DuPont Company during the 19th century. So it shows the person's name at the top. It tells you how much they were paid. You can even figure out things like how much they paid in school tax, pew rent at the local church, all sorts of things based on these books. You can even track people forward and backward throughout time to see how long they worked for the DuPont Company, get a sense of, of who they were and what they did. And so these work well with other local record sources like uh, the Catholic Diocese of Wilmington, which is just up the road at St. Joseph's on the Brandywine Roman Catholic Church, which have 
local birth and death records, marriage records for the Catholic Church, things like that. So we are a, a local repository for things like genealogical records. And also, in the front of this book, to give a bit of a belated shout-out for St. Patrick's Day, the DuPont Company got into transporting workers over from Ireland. So this is also documented in these books. You can see when people came over from Ireland and how much money was paid for their transport from Ireland to the United States. And so DuPont did this not to put workers in a bit of indentured servitude or have anything bad happen to them. They just thought that Irish people were good workers and they liked what they did. So they worked out an arrangement with travel agents, transport agents in Philadelphia. This record is for one named Robert Taylor to get good prices on getting people from Ireland to the U.S. So many of them shipped out of Londonderry or out of Liverpool, came to the Port of Philadelphia or in through Newcastle, Delaware, ended up working for DuPont. And so the situation was that uh, as you worked for the company, you could pay off your debt that way. You didn't have to work for the company to get DuPont to front the money. So that's another interesting aspect of this as well. So happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you out there. Lucas, we have a quick question from Sean, and he is asking, in regards to the garden, are there any original trees left? There are a few original trees left. There is a, a national co-champion Osage orange, which E.I. DuPont planted. There are a couple of buckeyes that are left. Many of these trees have suffered attrition over time, but there are still a few of them left. That uh, If you come to take a tour, that's one of the things that our guide staff will point out to you is some of the original trees that are here, original plants that were here and also what plants that we've planted that are based upon original heirloom species. So another wonderful aspect of our collections is that E.I. DuPont documented a lot of native species, sent a lot of those to France, sent them to Europe, but then also had a lot of European species of plants brought in. So there's lists upon lists of all the plant exchanges. And uh, one of the people with whom he exchanged plants was Josephine Bonaparte. So some native species from Delaware ended up at the Chateau de Mamesson in France on account of the Ida Pont sending directly to her. Okay. So let's get into a little bit of artwork that's here too. E.I. DuPont's daughters absolutely love to draw. So this was part of their education at Madame Rivardi's school in Philadelphia and also part of what they did here at home. And so not only was it a pastime, but it becomes a wonderful document of flora and fauna on the Brandywine, life on the Brandywine. So part of how we can do our reconstruction projects here is based on a lot of these drawings that were done. And to give you an example of a really detailed one, this was done by Eleuthera DuPont. And the date is August 31st, 1826. And what this is showing is the Brandywine River and some of the mills on the Brandywine River. So this is some of the best extant documentation of mills, of houses, homes, people on the Brandywine from the first quarter of the 19th century. To go along with that, they also documented many of the flowers, plants, trees, again the flora and fauna of the Brandywine. Many of these are fantastically detailed, exquisite drawings of Again, everything that they encountered whenever they were out and about on the Brandywine. One of my favorite bits of drawing is Eleuthera DuPont's bird book. So this is a blue jay that she drew. These were all done in the 1820s. And if you can get really close in on it, and I'm not sure that you could see this on the video feed we're showing you today, but it's so well detailed that even the details of the feathers are drawn in. You can see all the little pencil marks and watercolor marks. So these are absolutely fantastic drawings of some of the birds that you would have encountered here on the Brandywine. And let me flip a few pages for you so you can see what some of these look like. And fortunately for us, these are all named and dated too. Barb says, beautiful. Andre says, love the bird book. It is one of my favorites. I love showing this book off. The daughters also depicted life inside the Eleutherian Mills house. So some of the things that they did, like reading, drawing, making things. This is a, one of my favorite of Sophie DuPont's drawings. This shows Sophie and her sisters making cherry bounce. So remember yesterday in my preview, I said bring up the beverage of your choice. So if you've got some cherry bounce at home, yay hey. 
otherwise have a cup of coffee. But again, these are uh, an example of some of the lovely things that we have in our collections. And you see the size of these too, in comparison to the size of my hands. It's hard whenever you see scans of these to get a sense of the, their size. That some of them are really large, some of them are tiny, some of them are even smaller than this. You know, so they're incredibly intricate drawings. The last drawing that I'm going to show you from the daughters, and this is one of my favorites as well, this is actually a painting on silk. A really nice, delicate piece. This was done by Eleuthera Dupont again in the 1820s. Michael has a quick question. Are any of these drawings digitized or available online? That's a fantastic question, and I'm glad you asked. They are digitized and online, so you can, some of them are, not all of them. You can go to our digital archives, which are at digital.hagley.org. A uh, search engine will pop up, or you can look for some of these drawings, a whole group of our photographs, all sorts of things are available in the Hagley Digital Archives. It's a wonderful resource. Uh, I want to give you a warning all out there, though. Not everything in our library has been digitized. That for all the thousands of things that show up, it only kind of scratches the surface of everything that's here. Just like today's walkabout, it's only kind of scratching the surface. So be aware, but you can view some of these online. We do have high resolution scans of them available in the digital archives. So some of you who are inclined to military history will get a kick out of this, which is one of my other favorite things here. This is the diploma from the United States Military Academy for Henry DuPont. So uh, shameless plug for myself here. I'm writing a book about Henry DuPont and his role in keeping Delaware loyal to the Union during the Civil War. And part of what makes him important during the Civil War is that he was a West Point graduate. So this is his diploma from the class of 1833. He immediately went into the United States Artillery, into the 4th U.S. Artillery, served in Alabama, then Fortress Monroe, and then resigned his commission to come home to Delaware. So from 1834 on, he was a big player with the Delaware Militia, but also one of the main players with the DuPont Company. He became president of the DuPont Company in 1850 and stayed head of the company until his death in 1889. But this is a pretty important document for us because it shows, again, that he graduated from the U.S. Military Academy and got a formal education. His son, Henry Algernon DuPont, also went to the U.S. Military Academy. He graduated first in his class in 1861 and served with distinction during the American Civil War and later received the Medal of Honor for his part in the Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia. So uh, a shout out to Matt up at Winterthur who uh, did a tour like this earlier this week who showed Henry A. DuPont's brevet commission to Lieutenant Colonel. This is this guy's father. So those of you who are following on then, there's a direct connection to the collections at Winterthur to the things that we have here at Hagley. And so many of you out there who know me well know that I love the history of the United States Navy. And so this is a unique and interesting piece in our collections from the papers of Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont. This is a watercolor that depicts a battle between ironclad vessels in June of 1864. So what you're seeing is a Confederate ironclad, the CSS Atlanta, being fought by the USS Weehawken and the USS Nahant. So this ended up being a pretty short battle. It only lasted about 15 minutes. That part of Samuel Francis DuPont's role in the Civil War was being the first commander to use squadrons of ironclad vessels in combat. And so one of his arguments was that ironclad vessels were fantastic for fighting other ironclad vessels and not shooting at forts because you couldn't elevate the guns high enough or shoot them fast enough, but you could with other ships. So the CSS Atlanta, which is based out of Georgia, had been the scourge of the U.S. Navy. So he sent two ironclads, two uh, Passaic-class monitors to be specific, to capture this boat. They were outfitted with the newest called Dahlgren guns and if you look really closely, there's depicted a hole right here in the casemate of the Atlanta and then another hole just here. 
So the Wee Hawken, the ship in the lead, only fired two shots, and both of them went through the hull. They caused so much damage within the Atlanta that the ship ran aground. And so they immediately hauled up the white flag and surrendered. The crew of the USS Nahant were terribly upset because they didn't get to fire any shots in this battle. But it proved a point for Admiral DuPont of how good these ships could be fighting one another. Another important thing about this drawing is that it was done by an artist named Xanthus Russell Smith. So he later went on to fame as a marine artist, drawing marine scapes. He was on Admiral DuPont's staff at Port Royal in South Carolina and made some side money for himself drawing pictures of ships in the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. So after Samuel Francis DuPont got relieved of command in 1863, he hired Xanthus Smith to come here to the Brandywine and do paintings and drawings of actions like this for him to help prove some of the points he was making. And we can get into this with another episode of the ins and outs of Samuel Francis DuPont. But he's a pretty important marine artist whose work is here at Hagley. This is being one of his early drawings. So we'll transit around here. Call to the tether here, so we'll have to go slowly. So I know some of you, my friends from back home in North Carolina, are gonna be familiar with this guy, and many of you throughout the nation, Jeff Gordon. So one of the wonderful parts of our collections documents the DuPont Company's PR, public relations efforts, not the least of which has to do with Jeff Gordon, the Rainbow Warrior. So getting out there to promote things like popular sporting events. He was a pretty popular guy who drove for a long time, always using the DuPont logo while DuPont was still sponsoring him. So we have neat things like this, which is a standalone cutout. So this was something that you would find in a paint store. You could go in and see this standing up on the counter to promote paints that DuPont made during the uh, 1990s. And let's not forget Jeff Gordon's appearance on the Frosted Mini Weeds box. Yep, you guessed it, sponsored by DuPont. So these are some of the items we have in our collections to document the DuPont Company's public relations and outreach efforts, how they made the sale for getting people's attention onto their products. So my friend Al down in Texas had asked before all of uh, I started with this if we had any typewriters in our collection, any old typewriters. We actually don't have typewriters, but we have some documentation from the Remington Company, which made typewriters. So this boat anchor of a volume, which I have for you here today, depicts keyboard diagrams. So the Remington Company made keyboards in many different languages. This is a, one of the uh, Chinese dialects. And as you flip through, you can see various English idiosyncratic ones on some of the uh, foreign language ones here. Here's one specifically done up for the Bulgarian. Many in Cyrillic. There are many that are specific for business, for industry, but this gives you a sense, looking at how big this book is, how many keyboard diagrams there are. And this is one of three volumes of keyboard diagrams. These all date to the early, 19, or the early 20th century, from around 1900 up through the mid-1920s. So we have researchers who come to look specifically at the Remington Collection to see what types of typewriters they made for people around the world. And some of the correspondence is even included in here, too, as to why they started in with various typewriters that they did. John would like to say that we have two Remington typewriters in our collection. Both are on display here in Shippensburg. Fantastic. Then, John, come and see some of our keyboard diagrams. So now we come to one of the more unique pieces of our collection. And this is where you'll see me pull out the gloves because we're going to start handling objects. So with handling paper, it's okay if you touch it with your bare hands, but whenever you're handling some of these objects, it's best to wear gloves. These are just regular nitrile gloves. And they're made to fit well, so I'm just having to pull them on my fingers here. So 
So this next object I'm going to show you, I'm thinking of specifically uh, my friend Jason in New Zealand and some of my other friends who love Victorian era history and culture. What you're seeing here on the table is a patent paper from Great Britain. You notice it reads Victoria by the grace of God. This is a patent from 1874 for a piece of machinery that went into a firearm for a repeating mechanism for a firearm. But this isn't the really fun and unique bit of this. What is, is this big chunk of stuff hooked to the bottom of it. This is actually a wax seal. In its original tin container, by the way, it's an original wax seal depicting Queen Victoria. So this is Victoria's seal from the 1870s. And you can see how big it is in my hand. This thing is absolutely huge. And so could you imagine getting this in the mail with your patent application? And it is two-sided. Let me show you the other side here. Which has Victoria's royal cipher. So this is a pretty fantastic and unique piece that's in our collection. But so uh, a specific shout out to all my friends out there who are into Victorian history and culture. Uh, this is a, a lovely piece. I was absolutely delighted to have come across this in our collections. Another really unique piece that doesn't often see the light of day. And this is for all my friends who do World War II history. This is Adolf the Pig. So this is a piggy bank made by a guy named Thomas Lamb. So this was part, we actually have the original box that it goes into, the Adolf the Pig Bank. Save and make him squeal, it says. V for victory by Victory Bonds. The idea was that you put your coins into your Adolf the Pig Bank, and then whenever you filled it up, you had the pleasure of taking Adolf out and hitting him with a hammer, busting up Adolf to save the world and eliminate people like Adolf Hitler. Some of these were even outfitted with a little mechanism in the top that when you put in a coin, it would squeal. So these are pretty fun and unique pieces, and uh, a really fragile one too because this is a, uh, a piece that's made out of ceramic, and you can see that some of the paint is cracking on it a little bit too. But we're pretty happy to have this in our collection as, as an intact piece. So V for victory. Save and make Adolf squeal. So we'll work our way down to the next piece here. This is also part of the fun of wearing nitrile gloves is getting them on and off. <laughs> Always be safe out there handling objects and collections and also be safe out in the world in general. This document, which I'll point out something, a couple of things about it before I tell you what it is. Two are these tags that read unclassified. And so this document was officially declassified for the US, by the US government on November 29th, 1988. And it also reads up here in this top corner, save this document forever, a rare document. So what in the world is it that would have to be declassified like this and have a special note that says save it forever? The DuPont Company had a large role to play in the Manhattan Project. So whenever the World War II got rolling, the government asked DuPont to be part of the Manhattan Project to make plutonium, to sort of figure out how, how do we make this all material. So DuPont's role was coming up with the first practical operating industrial scale nuclear reactor. So they did a lot of this work in conjunction with the Manhattan District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, since the Manhattan Project, and then what was called the Metallurgical Project at the University of Chicago. So DuPont was responsible for designing these reactors, coming up with operational protocols, safety protocols. So the document you're looking at is the first user's manual for the first operational nuclear reactor in the United States. And it reads, preliminary process of a liquid-cooled power plant. So what you see when you flip through this book are drawings 
to show how they put together safety protocols, what this thing was supposed to look like, but then also bits about how it should operate. Because one of the things that they realized pretty quickly, and they had lots of experience with, is how do you handle really dangerous stuff? And so that's part of the reason why the government asked DuPont to be involved with the Manhattan Project. So indeed, a rare and unique thing that's in our collections that we're pretty proud to have here. So we'll move on around to our other table. And please, if you've got any questions at home, comments, throw them out there. While we're walking, I want to give a special shout out to my friend Emily in the Schuylkill Valley Middle School, all of her students that are out there. I know that uh, you all aren't watching live, but you're going to watch it later, and I'm pretty happy that you're going to do that, and I think Emily might be out there too. I'm glad to be able to get this content out to folks who are middle schoolers, some of you who are homeschooled, and all of you kids that are in public schools that are home for the day. So mind your parents, eat your Wheaties, wash your hands, and go to libraries and museums whenever everything's open. <laughs> so not to leave out fashion and color and things like design that's in our collections, and we'll, we'll get you into the home stretch here with some of the stuff that's, that's in our collections. This lovely piece is from a group called the Inter-Society Color Council. So this was a organization created in the United States to come up with standardized colors. So if you order something and you expect it to be the same color, how do you do that? So one of the pieces to that process is figuring out what standard colors look like. So every year they would put out a card like this, which has all these different little pieces of silk or wool or various materials. It has the colors listed and also numbers, so coming up with individual numbers. And so combining this with the dye industry, that way you can make sure to replicate colors such that what looks one thing in one place will look the same somewhere else. So this particular color card are the spring colors from 1920 from the National Silk Dyeing Company of Patterson, New Jersey, Allentown, Pennsylvania, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and Dundee Lake, New Jersey. So the Inner Society Color Council collected these from around the world. We have these color cards that come from France, from Japan, from all over the United States and Europe to help figure out what standard colors were supposed to look like. So a United States, another United States agency that dealt with this was uh, the Textile Color Card Association. So this is examples of the 1954 spring and summer hosiery color card. So what you're seeing are colors for stockings and hose. Notice that it's on this lovely palette. That way you can see the palette of hosiery colors for 1954. Jenna asks, are the color cards accept, um, acceptable online? There are accessible. They are hard not accessible online, in part because they're they're hard to digitize, given how big they are. But uh, whenever our library is back open for business, you're welcome to come at any time and take a look at them there. Or if you have questions about any of them in particular, shameless plug for our institution, you can send questions to us via Ask Hagley, the Ask Hagley form. It is askhagley at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y. So whenever that comes in, we're gonna, we'll try our best to get to your questions, uh, but whenever things are back up and running, we can get that in and out to you pretty quickly. So if you wanna know more about these color cards, fire us off an email there. Another aspect of our collections, which is pretty fun and interesting, many of you probably wouldn't think of something like a Cuisinart as being a museum object or something that would be embedded in a library. So why in the world do we have a Cuisinart and cooking equipment here? So this is from the collection of a man named Mark Harrison, and he worked on what was called universal design. He was thinking along with a lot of other people after the end of World War II, how do we help disabled veterans get access to things, be part of the world in which they live? How do we help disabled people in general be a part of the world in which they live? And so you come up with all sorts of solutions to the problem, like uh, types of door handles instead of ones that you have to twist, ones that you just push and pull, uh, all sorts of, of innovations that come out of that line. And so some of the designs that Mark Harrison put together for the Cuisinart were part of this universal design movement. So one of the things to point out about this Cuisinart, as soon as I can get these gloves on my hands, 
the perils of working in a library, for instance. One of the things to point out about this Cuisinart are the buttons. So instead of small buttons, that you, or levers that you have to twist, they're big buttons that you push. It takes one hand to push it on and off. Everything that you do, you can just give it a twist. Everything is big, the handles are big, so it's made so that if you, if you have problems gripping, have problems pushing or pulling, that you can still use these objects. And so that's part of what makes these unique and an important part of American design history is that they're part of this larger process of figuring out how to make things that a majority of people can use or how do you make things that people with disabilities can use. One of the leaders in this was Tom Lamb. Remember back to Adolf the Pig. One of the things that he became known in the United States for was making handles. So these are ergonomic handles that can be put on suitcases, cutlery, all sorts of things. This one perhaps happens to be on a piece of wherever aluminum. But the idea being that you can grip it and keep a good grip and that it's easy to pick up and put down. So he designed his handle for all sorts of kitchenware, like these wherever pots, potato mashers, and one of my absolute favorites, an ergonomic crutch. Because any of you out there that has ever had to use a crutch know how terrible they are to use. And part of the idea of this one is that you've got this ergonomic handle. And then you've also got a more ergonomic piece that goes under your arm. That way they're way more comfortable to use and you can keep better control as you're using these objects. So one of the strengths of our collections here at Hagley is that not only do we have paper records, We've got objects too. So for all of the pieces that you see out here on the table, we've got the back-end documentation, design drawings, correspondence back and forth about how they came to the conclusions they needed to come to, how to get these things into production. So when you come here to do research on these, you can follow the train from the idea to the finished product, which is pretty incredible. A piece that is not universal design, but unique nonetheless, is this wonderful piece. And I could not show this. This is one of my favorite pieces in the collection. This is a uh, kitchen utensil called the Kebabit, designed by a guy named Marshall Johnson. Marshall Johnson was an industrial designer. He worked for places like Proctor Silex and uh, Black & Decker, did things like jigsaws and electric shavers and power drills. But one of the things that he designed was this piece called the Kebabit. So it's a way to make kebabs. You lift off the glass shield and you have your skewers. When you plug this thing in and turn it on, the skewers rotate around the central heating element. All of the fat drips out and you can pull out the cup just like the George Foreman drill and get rid of it. Buy today, save, save, save. So you can pull these out, one end comes off, that way you can skewer whatever you're gonna put on here. Put it back together, drop everything in place. Put your top back on, flip the switch, and off you go. Off to wonderful vegetables and roasted meats. Marshall Johnson is a, a lovely person and an interesting guy. We are lucky that his collection came to us through him directly, so he's been able to tell us the backstory off of most everything that's here that was part of his collection. So it's been a wonderful documentation of why he did what he did and about all the things that he came up with, all the companies that he worked for and the people that he knew in the design field, which is pretty fun and unique. Sarah said, well, now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so here's another fun and interesting piece for uh, friends who are both into World War II and into cosmetics. This is the design portfolio of a lady named Clarita Steubenborg. And so she did a lot of design, package design, for various cosmetic companies in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So one of the ones she came up with was this package called Montezuma Red, marketed directly to women who were in the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II. And so these are some of the advertisements that went with them. So she did a lot of work for, for some of these companies, but the Montezuma Red is a pretty neat one. She also came up with this piece called the Date Bait Kit, which if you wanted to make sure that as a college girl you could get a date if you 
wore all the stuff, did everything that it told you to do within this kit, which was actually a little kit of cosmetics and things to apply the cosmetics with, then uh, you were gonna be able to go out and get a date. So high culture from the 1950s. So this is also examples of some of her uh, packaging designs from that era and her original design drawings. So the last designer that we'll talk with you about today is one named William Pallman, and that's spelled P-A-H-L-M-A-N-N. -N. He's a pretty important guy in American design history. He operated out of New York from the 1930s up until he retired from the business in 1977. So he's one of the people who came up with a concept of furnishing a room to sell furniture. So before he started doing this with department stores in New York, you would go into a place and see a bunch of chairs together in a room and people are like, eh, well, it's a chair, great. So he's like, well, let's set up a model room, set up everything like it would look in your room. That way people can see it in context. They can think about what it's going to look like. So he achieved pretty good success with that. He later went on to do a lot of design work for major U.S. companies and restaurants. And we are lucky to have a lot of his full color renderings in our collection. So this is one of about 50 renderings that we have in our collections that he did. This is for the DuPont Company's textile fiber suite, which is in the Empire State Building in New York in the early 1960s. And notice all the lovely eye-searing colors. You know, this was part of William Paulman's style, big as life and twice as natural, so to speak. So lovely drawings. His collection is, is pretty fantastic too in that we've got all of the back end records too. So you can see how he kept his books, how they went about finding clients, keeping clients, doing all the work that you needed to do for interior and, interior and industrial design. So one of his crowning achievements was the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building in New York. So Philip Johnson is the one who actually designed the restaurant. William Pallman did the interior decor and things like this, which is the menu for luncheon at the Four Seasons. Pallman is also the one who came up with the idea of changing the seasons. So whenever you would go in spring, summer, fall, and winter, you would see the seasons change, the decor would change. Like with this menu, this is the one for fall. And you can see the different symbols but we have all the documentation here for that as well. And where we're gonna leave you today, and thank you for sticking with me throughout this and taking the back end tour of Hagley, one of the things that I want to mention is that you've just scratched the surface of everything that's here. We've not gone deep at all into some of the things that are here in our archives. And we've not even gone into a whole other building of library materials and a whole other building of museum materials. So stay tuned for more content coming out from Hagley. Stay tuned for us being open again. That way you can come and see some of this stuff for yourself. But uh, where I'll leave you was with this incredibly unassuming autograph album from the mid-19th century. And it belonged to this man, Lieutenant Colonel William A. Lamott of Wilmington, Delaware. His job toward the end of the American Civil War was working with the defenses of Washington, D.C. And so his job took him into contact with a lot of important people, not the least of which was President Abraham Lincoln. So in 1865, when the war was winding down, the American Civil War was winding down, he took this autograph album to Lincoln's office and said, Mr. President, will you sign my album? To which Lincoln replied, sure, I'll do it before I go to the theater. So the very first autograph in this book is one of the last signatures of Abraham Lincoln. Unfortunately, the president didn't date this autograph, but we do know it's one of the last. His secretary, John Hay, returned this book to William Lamott after Lincoln's assassination. So this is a fantastically unique and interesting piece, but it doesn't stop here. So after Lincoln's signature, the next one is Andrew Johnson as President of the United States. This one's dated May 4th, 1865. So Lamont took this book around to everybody he could find 
people like William Seward, Gideon Wills, Secretary of the Navy, Gustavus Fox, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, people like Ulysses S. Grant, then head of the United States Armies, anybody who was important in the U.S. government, he took around and got to sign this album. Philip Sheridan, pretty famous general from the Civil War. And let me find my favorite signature, this one. And this is going to really stretch the limits of your literary knowledge. This is the signature of Lou Wallace. So if any of you have ever read or watched the, read the book or watched the film Ben-Hur, Lou Wallace was the author of Ben-Hur. He was, during the Civil War, a general in the Union Army, later went on to literary fame. So even the author of Ben-Hur signed William Lamott's autograph album. So friends, thank you for sticking with us today. Thank you for being with us on this brief tour through Hagley's treasures here in our reading room. Please join us again for more content. And I also want to give a great shout out to all of my friends out there in various museums and libraries that are doing the same thing. To Elena and Ryan with the Battleship New Jersey who are doing a cast every day. To my friends Kevin and Greg with the historic ships at the Independent Seaport Museum. My friend Scott with Fort Dobbs State Historic Site down around Statesville, North Carolina. Keep the content coming. Tune in to these people. Listen to what they've got going on. We're trying to bring everything to you since you can't come to us. And also support your museums. Be sure to get out there if you've wanted to be a member and of, of a particular museum or a group and you want to, please do so now. Support humanities organizations, arts organizations. Now is the time to do that. So my shameless plug beating my shoe on the lectern, so to speak, for what we do. We can't do it without you. So please jump in and support us. Be a part of public history, public humanities, the arts in the United States. All right, everyone, wash your hands, be safe out there, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.